Hi, I've been meaning to do this for a while. I've got a lot of Judas Priest vinyl, um, which uh, I love, but I don't listen to anymore because I listen to the CDs and I've had it years. So after I've done this, at some point in the future, I'll be selling it. Um, so it's a bit of an advert, really. Um, but uh, I don't listen to vinyl now, not because I like it, it's just not convenient, it doesn't so suit my lifestyle. So I thought I'd show and go through my um, Jesus Priest vinyl, just talk about each album, when I got it, and what I feel about it. So. Uh, for the people in the know, you'll know what the first album is. For the uninitiated, it's Rock and Roll from 1974. Okay, uh, unusual Coca Cola bottle top uh, artwork there. As you can see, it's not a very metal cover. It hasn't got the classic Judas Priest logo. Well, there's two. There's the Sad Wings logo. We'll come to that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's how would you describe this album? <clears throat> well. I first got this in uh, September, it would be, 1981. I know it was September because I went on holiday and we got back. And that Sunday, the Sunday, um, the day after we got back, we went to Kendall and one of the shops, the record shop in Kendall was open on a Sunday called Smides. They also had a branch in Bowen S at the back of another shop. And they had a copy of this with a cutout. So it was like that thick card and when you get cut out, they go cheap. So it was £2.99. That was a gold pressing. I like when I sold that. I got another pressing, something called the Milan label. Then I bought it on CD. I've had it on CD about two or three times. Uh, I've got a CD of a Japanese remaster, which sounds great. 24-bit. Uh, and I got this vinyl fairly recently, and it's a gold pressing. Uh, it's actually a fairly... It might be a first pressing, because pressing, on the back, it's at the bottom, it says, thanks for the words, Al. don't know if you can see that there. And that is a reference to Al Atkins, the original Jesus Priest singer, who actually co-wrote a lot of the songs on this album. So what's this album like? It's Judas Priest, um, principally known for heavy metal, but they have made a hard rock album, they've made a hair metal album, and they've made a symphonic metal album. This is a heavy rock record with a lot of blues influence. And that's what sets it apart. It doesn't sound like a typical Priest album. Um, but as the years have gone by, I mean, when I was younger, it was kind of like, oh, rock and roll, you know, it doesn't sound like Priest as much. And a few years ago, I was, at, um, I was in Amsterdam and I went to the Hard Rock Cafe and we, we got shown to our table by a guy. And I was wearing a Priest t-shirt and he goes like, oh, Judas Priest, um, what's your least favourite album? Or what's your favourite album? What's your least favourite album? And I said, well, rock and roll is probably my least favourite. And he goes, oh, I really like that album. You know, I love Cheetah and stuff like that. And, and then it occurred to me, and why why was I picking rock and roll? That's just because it's not a typical pre sounding record, and just because it's not metal. And um, you know, I kind of uh, started listening to it at different ears then, and just accepting it for what it is, which is a really good blues heavy rock record that competes with other stuff released at the time. You know, there's bands like Deep Purple, Wishbone, Ash, Uriah Heep, um, all releasing albums around 74 and, and this sits quite happily along that side those releases um some really cool tracks one for the road rock and roller the winter suite which um takes up three tracks uh cheetah which i mentioned before never satisfied which is often the track most mentioned on this album it's a really heavy bluesy track run of the mill which up until uh lock and s i think was priest's uh, longest ever track which has got really cool simps by Glenn Tipton, an amazing Halfa performance. And then you've got Dying to Meet You, which is kind of a song in two parts. And I think it was maybe supposed to be called Dying to Meet You and Hero Hero. Hero Hero was the title of a compilation album uh, that was put up by Gull in the early 80s. But on this track, I think the original was maybe supposed to be kind of two. And then it finishes on a lighter note with Caviar and Meths. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I really like the record. Uh, it's sort of not a really auspicious start, um, but um, uh, it was an important album for them in the sense that it got them out there, got them more gigs, and it got them taken more seriously. So that's Rock and Roller. Yeah. Um, like I say, you see there, it's a gold pressing. Um, it's the original label they were on. Next album, totally jumping up. Uh, this uh, is one of my favourite albums of all time. Uh, and um, it's a classic heavy metal on with Sad Wings of Destiny. Um, so basically, you know, let's look at that absolutely classic cover by Patrick Woodruff. Um, yeah, when, when this album, uh, 
you know, we used to go to record shops when I was a kid. You go to Virgin or HMV in a big city and you have all the shrink wrapped albums. And it was hard to find the early priest ones, you know, you couldn't find them in your small shops. Uh, so you go to the big city and you'd see this album and it kind of took on a kind of mythical awe for me. The cover was so awesome and the band looked so different, you know. It just really excited me. So I'd heard the tracks off this on the Unleashed in the East live album. Uh, so when when we first put it on, it was kind of really unusual to the production. Uh, it's very dry. It's almost like priests are in the room with you. It's like you're in a rehearsal room with them, and they're, they're there. And I've always loved that about it. I love the studio versions. Um, uh, it's a total classic, you know, uh, picking up from from Sabbath and Purple and what those bands were doing, and then progressing metal forward uh, through the back half of the 70s, ready for 1980. Um, you know, you've got Stats of a Victim and Changes, all-time classic, Ripper. Then there's uh, Dreamer Deceiver going into Deceiver, which is phenomenal tracks. Halford's vocal performance on Dreamer Deceiver is astonishing. Um, go on the side too. There's a little instrumental prelude uh, written by Glenn Tipton, which is a nice piece of music. And then you get into Tyrant, Genocide, Epitaph and Island Domination. Epitaph's a really cool piano piece. Um, quite Queen influence and Island of Domination is one of the best um, you know best tracks ever to end a Priest album um, yeah so it's a funny story with this album and I've got uh, my own press in Gullwyn but um, uh, my brother ordered it from uh, the off off um, off aforementioned Smythe's Records in Bowness, uh, and then we were, we were bored one Sunday and he rang them up and did he ring them up to check if it was in or maybe he just went on spec basically he cycled from Old Hutton where we lived all the way up to Windermere, which is about a 30 mile round trip. Uh, and I just kind of waited at the end of, we had like a boiler at the end of the garden. I kind of stood on that waiting for him to come over the hill on the bike. We, we lived in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then I saw him, you know, come over the hill and like, you know, he had it in the brown paper bag um, that they came in when he put in an order of Smives. So it was straight into uh, my older brother's bedroom and we put it on the um, Sharp Music Centre. And, uh, you know, life was never the same. One of the all time classics, and that's Sad Wings of Destiny. Next up is their third album. They signed to CBS, they get them a £60,000 advance, which is about £300,000 in today's money. So that set them up um, to go out and uh, do what they need to do and um, do big support slots. Uh, it's produced by Roger Glover, showing the cover. It's a great cover, again, really cool, using the sort of second uh, classic, or the, well, the first classic Priest logo. Got a really cool back, you know, you've got his skull there. Um, it's great artwork. I mean, the 70s rock artwork's just classic. No inner sleeve with this as well, CBS pressing. Um, yeah, what's this album like? So, um, you know, when I was younger, I really loved this album. I didn't like it as much as Sad Wings or the album After Staying Class, but it has become a classic as time's gone on. Um, uh, and it's seeped into the, the culture. It's, it's a really influential album. Side one, first three tracks, Sinner, Diamonds and Rust, Starbreaker. Obviously I'd heard, uh, yeah, I heard this album before Unleashed in the East. This was actually the first album that a family member bought. I think they bought it, it was a nice price, £2.99 in Woolworths in Kendall. Could be wrong, but I think it was, about 81 80 um, so you got Sinner, Diamonds and Rust, uh, third track, Starbreaker, is probably my favourite priest track of all time. Uh, you know, Rob Halford's vocal on this. Is just it's for me. It's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, vocal ever. At the end, he does a climbing scream as the track's fading out. Fade out's really important in the seventies, and it just it's like it just reaches for the stratosphere. Uh, it's absolutely. If you listen to this track, just turn your fader up and just listen to what Halford does. Um, no one's done it before then, and no one's done it since, in my opinion. Um, then it finishes the side one with a, a really nice ballad, "Last Rose of Summer." Um, showing a lot of diversity. Uh, then side two, uh, it actually gets muddled up on the vinyl. It says it's let us pray, but in actual fa fact, it's let us pray slash call for the priest. And then the second track on side two is raw deal. But on the vinyl here, if you can see, uh, it doesn't say that. Um, uh, so um, yeah, let us pray is a really fast double kick drum. Uh, track uh, so the drummer on this is a session drummer Simon Phillips and he gives it a phenomenal performance and kind of invents uh, you know where metal drumming is going to go in the process he gets a really cool drum sound um, then uh, yeah let's pray into Call for the Priest 
you got Raw Deal, which is a kind of a groovy track. Uh, got a great Halford scream at the end. Interesting lyrics. Uh, so um, uh, it's about um, the lyrics on that about Halford going to gay bars. I think uh, uh, as a gay man, you know, experiencing that at the time. Uh, so it's it's good. A uh, really cool track. Uh, track uh, next track. Here come the tears. Really cool ballad with some operatics from Halford at the end. And then it finishes with a track you may be familiar with if you're not familiar with Priest, which is Dissident Aggressor. And this was covered by uh, Slayer on the South of Heaven album. Uh, so Dissident Aggressor is like an incredible track. Uh, it's got an amazing riff, um, really heavy guitar sound, awesome uh, KK solo. Um, and um, Halford, again, just gives an astonishing vocal performance with like um, stratospheric screams. Uh, yeah, so this song's actually produced by Roger Glover. Like I say, for years, I, I kind of wasn't his into production, but it, it does sound good. It's quite polished, quite a lot of harmonies. Um, but a, a, a classic album, just uh, an important album in the genre of metal. So the next one is, I think, maybe, well, it's an all-time classic. Again, it's a stained class. Um, brilliant, you can see here they've changed the image, they've got the classic Judas Priest logo now, they've gone for a sci-fi look. Um, originally this came with an inner sleeve, and there it is. We've got a cool picture of the band, not in the studs and leather yet. Um, <clears throat> I first got this album from a second-hand record shop in Lancaster Market called Hedgehog Records. Um, and uh, I'd actually seen the album out in a copy in a Virgin, I think it was in Coventry. I've got relatives from Coventry, so it was in a Virgin in Coventry on my school holidays. And like, I just wanted to see what weather's in a sleeve and how long the tracks were. I was a bit obsessed by how long songs were, so I actually slipped down the shrink wrapping and pulled it out in the shop while I was looking. And then I saw that the track, the second last track, Beyond the Realms of Death, was nearly seven minutes long, and that really excited me because I thought oh, it must be really epic. Which it is, it's the, basically one of the inventors of the, the metal ballad. Um, obviously, the Sad Wings album, you had Dreamy Deceiver. Now you have Beyond the Realms of Death taking that further. It also features one of the great all-time guitar solos um, by anyone, I think, but Glenn Tipton does a, a solo. It lasts about a minute and a half, but it's so well-structured. Um, so what the track's like on this exciter, classic double kick drum uh, song. Uh, Les Binks now on drums. Brilliant for many people, their all-time favourite Judas Priest drummer. Why He Red Hot, brilliant, really cool. Better By You Better Than Me, that's a cover version of a band, Spooky Tooth. It's really great, top. Then probably my favourite track on the album, the title track, Stained Class. Absolutely phenomenal. If you listen to Rob Halford's live Insurrection album from the early noughties, he does a version of this with his band and it's brilliant. And then you've got Invader, cool little sci-fi track on the end. And the side two saints in hell it's classic savage excellent about um uh, uh, colonialism and imperialism cool lyric beyond the realms of death probably tails off with the the last track heroes end it's a really good track it's good it's just not quite as good as the other stuff but it's pretty top the other thing with this album it's the first album where ian hill switches to a pick and that's quite innovative in in the history of metal obviously most bass players play with their fingers before this pretty much all of them did then Ian Hill starts to simplify his bass lines and play with a pick to get a, a more attack and emphasise the downbeat. Uh, and combined with more of so the top end of the production and the double kick drum work, it starts to set the sound, tone of how metal albums will sound. Not a lot of distortion in this album. If you listen to it, you probably think it sounds quite light, but the technology is limited at the time. Um, yeah, it's, it's a classic. Um, you know, it's the band coming of age. Next up, <clears throat> it's another classic. Classic album cover, Killing 1978's Killing Machine. So Priest, um, Priest in, uh, pull off the feet of producing two great albums in one year, two classic albums. Very few bands have done this in history. Stained Class comes out February 78 and this comes out October. The other ones are Saxon, Wheels of Steel, Strong Arm of the Law, 1980. Um, I just found out Kiss, uh, Rock and Roll Over and Destroyer, both 1976. I think Kiss fans would consider those classics. Um, Uriah Heap, 1972, Demons and Wizards and The Magician's Birthday. Um, I can't think of another one offhand, but there'll be, there'll be other ones. Uh, someone can remind me. Um, yeah, so Killing Machine starts off with delivering the goods. 
awesome. Uh, this was the B-side. There was a live B-side on Living After Midnight single back in 980. So that's when I first heard the track. It's brilliant. It's just about, about going to a gig, you know, and priests are going to deliver the goods. Uh, they did a version of this Rob Half and Sebastian Back of Skid Row that you may have seen. It's just classic. Got an awesome tips and solo. Rock Forever, next track, great. Uh, some people knock the next track, Evening Scud Star. It's a kind of commercial pop metal track, but I love it. And it was on Top of the Pops in 1979. They got all-time classic, Hellbent for Leather, the ultimate sci-fi motorbiking song. And then Priest's first hit single, Take on the World. Um, this was on Top of the Pops in January 1979. And that was my first experience of uh, seeing Judas Priest and of heavy metal. I uh, didn't know it was heavy metal then, and I thought Judas Priest was Rob Halford. I thought the guy singing was called Judas Priest. So there we go. Side 2 opens up with something funky called Burning Up, which is a really cool track. Um, there you got the title track, Killing Machine. Um, quite interesting on this. Basically, Glenn or KK plays a guitar line. It feeds back over one side of the stereo spectrum, and then uh, the other guitarist comes in the other side. And again, this is something that um, uh, Slayer copy on the track. I think it's South of Heaven. Great track, Running Wild, another cool track. I'd already heard that on the um, uh, live Unleashed in the East album before we got this. Then there's a lovely ballad again. Probably wasn't as into this as a kid, but I think it's a beautiful song, Before the Dawn. Keke Downey's been playing that with his lineup recently. And then it finishes with Evil Fantasies, which is a down and dirty track. And the harness a really cool, very good drum sound on this, very Bonham esque. Um, something I should say about this album it's only six months from staying class but there's more distortion there's more drive um, and you can hear the technology has already come on where it sounds more metal um, yeah so uh, actually James Guffrey produced and engineered this and you may recognise his name from the Pink Floyd by the Wall and also The Warning by Queensryche um, yeah obviously I've got this actually it's on red vinyl um, there you go that was uh, something that happened back then. This is a copy I got later. You can see that it's got that had a sticker which I took off the front. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I first got this album. It wasn't me, it was my brother. My middle brother got it. He went on a school trip to Edinburgh. And when you went to the big cities, uh, when you live in the sticks, when you go to the big city, it means it's vinyl time. So he came back with two albums from Virgin or HMV in Edinburgh. And obviously one of them was Killing Machine and the other one was Rainbow Rising. So that was a cracking day or cracking night by the Hi-Fi. Next up, um, got the Unleashed in the East live album. Had this some summer 81, I think. Um, uh, it's a classic live album. Uh, it's only a single album and I think it benefits from that. You've got nine tracks, Exciter. Live version of Exciter is better than the studio, I think. Maybe the same for Running Wild. Great version of Sinner and Ripper. Then you've got their version of the Green Man Alishi with the two prong crown, which is a classic cover of the Fleetwood Mac track. I should just mention that the Killing Machine album was called Hellbent for Leather in the States, and that had the additional studio version of the Green Man Alishi. But I've always been more used to the live one. Side two, you've got a great version of Diamonds and Rust with a classic guitar intro by Glenn. Awesome version of Victim of Changes. And then Genocide and Tyrant from the Sad Wings album finish it. Uh, the version of Genocide's a little different, and I think it, it's better than the Sad Wings version. Um, <clears throat> no inner sleeve on this, um, but a lot of people, this is a lot of people's uh, all time fave Judas Priest album, you know, it got them into the band. A bit like, you know, Live and Dangerous or Strangers in the Night by UFO. Obviously, the other one's Finn Lizzy. Um, just, uh, you know, uh, the kind of actors are best of in an introduction to the band. Yeah, we. I listened to this to death. I went on a uh, holiday for a, a few days or a week to Cockham after a cottage when I was a kid, and it rained most of the time. And so we had a cassette player, and I taped the album from my vinyl, and I listened to that a lot of the time. Awesome. Next up is one of the most famous albums in heavy metal. Uh, one of the most important albums from 1980. It's British Steel. A lot of people would pick this as their all-time Priest, the most important album. It's brilliant. I love it. It's just, as I've got older, I prefer the 1970s stuff. I prefer the more progressive uh, influence. But this album's great. It's really stripped down. It's straight ahead. It, I think Priest are probably taking a leaf. You know, they've been hearing what Van Halen and ACDC have been doing. 
So the arrangements are really uh, to the point. This album's quite short, it's about 36 minutes. So shorter songs than their other albums, which are typically 40 minutes or more. Um, it's got loads of live favourites. You may have heard Metal Gods, Breaking the Law. You've heard that. Grinder, United, you may have heard. You might have seen that on Top of the Pops back in the day. And obviously Living After Midnight, which is a live staple. I still really like all those tracks. When Breaking the Law, Living After Midnight come on, I'm not one of these people who gets bored because um, I've heard them too much. I like the groove of the songs. Uh, and um, they just... Uh, hit the spot for me still, but probably what makes the album, you know, the points of interest are the deeper cuts that you don't hear as much. There's the opening track, Rapid Fire, which is really cool, quick track. Then side two opens with You Don't Have To Be Old To Be Wise, which is a brilliant track, really good. And then the, the last two tracks, The Rage and Steeler, The Rage has almost reggae intro and it's got a really heavy riff. Brilliant half of vocal on that. And then Steeler, as I mentioned before, that's a great up-tempo metal number. So. You know, it's a really good introduction to Priest. Um, this album, I can remember my brother bought it uh, in a bargain bin in Morecambe. It was my birthday, and uh, for my birthday I went to a place called Fun City with a few of my friends from primary school, uh, which is in Morecambe in the, the Fun Park. I don't know if it's still there now. And um, while I was in there, you know, my mate, he went just looking around Morecambe and he managed to find a record shop and he came back with this for £2.50. And this is actually that copy... So just gave that to me. I bought it off him. Uh, that really, that one really got me into priest. When he got that, I listened to that and I was like, right, I'm a total priest fan now. So with my birthday money, a few weeks later, I went and bought this because it just come out. Point of entry. Um, so yeah, controversial album. Let's just open this up because when you got this album, it had this inside, which is advertising merchandise. You can see all the previous releases along the top with CBS. And then various scarves and things like that. Looking at the prices on here. Postage 40p, t-shirts £4. Uh, sew on patch £1. Right. Awesome. So, what, um, let's just get like the issues with the cover. So the cover you got, I really like the cover, it's a really cool graphic. But uh, it's just not really metal, it's not really metal there. So when this came out, I think there was a little bit of confusion. Um, typically a lot of... Uh, you know, rock fans, metal fans would often get attracted to albums just because of the album cover. Um, and they had a different album cover for this in the States, which didn't really work. So there was marketing issues with it. Um, Priest did a really big tour on this in the UK. It was very successful with a top stage set. The main difference with this, al with this album is, is it's a hard rock album. It's not a heavy metal album, I think. I think Priest, uh, they've been out of the States, uh, probably on the British Steel tour, and tours before that, I think they're getting exposed to more of the stuff you got at rock radio, and I think that's inspiring them. I don't think um, necessarily uh, consciously, it's maybe just getting in there, you know, subconscious. So there's quite a lot of America Carnet influence in here. The, the opening track, Heading Out to the Highway, Desert Plains, feels like you know, you're know you out, um, out in Nevada or something, and so on. So there's quite a lot of sort of more Americanized uh, influence. Um, yeah, Hot Rockin's a great track. Uh, track three, track four, Turning Circles. Um, that's an unusual track. Again, it's got a sort of reggae-type intro. And it's quite a strange vocal by Rob Halford, but it's a really, really good track. Quite mature. Side two opens with Solar Angels. That's what they opened with on the Point of Entry 2. It's a brilliant track. Really good lyric, really cool sci-fi lyric. Golden Halos, Radiating Higher. That's the opening line. Epic. Then it's got a really strange track called You Say Yes. I like it, but if you played it as someone, you probably wouldn't know it was Judas Priest. Then there's All The Way, not as into that track. Troubleshoot, which is a cool ACDC sort of groove. And On The Run uh, finishes, which is a, a really good rocker. Um, so a lot of these tracks, Heading Out to Highway, Desert Plains, you know, Hot Rockin' do get played live by the band. But he didn't do as well for them. The Judas Priest style number had gone gold in the States initially. Um, but this, this didn't chart as well and didn't sell as well. Um, in the UK, it didn't do as well as British Steel. But in actual fact, if you look at 1990, sorry, 1981's chart placings for metal albums, most of them, uh, in 1980, a lot of them went top 10, top 20. But if you look at the, the sophomore releases of bands, typically they're falling outside the top 10 or the top 20. And so Priest, you know, um, 
they weren't uh, they weren't sticking out for doing that. I think everyone was doing that. You know, I remember the "Don't Go," uh, the song "Don't Go." The video was on Tiz was. So I got that album uh, as a shopping candle called Daily's Records, uh, and it'd been in there for quite a few weeks. And I went and got it. I got it for three pounds ninety nine. And that's still that's that copy. Next up, okay, this is one of the again another hugely important album. This is the first I would argue commercially successful out and out metal album in the United States. It's double platinum, five million copies sold worldwide. Screaming for vengeance. Priests need to make a statement. Basically, point of entry hasn't done quite as well. It feels like they've lost ground a bit. They make this album. So when it came out, I remember the review in Kerrang was just absolutely stupendous. Um, I'd heard the track Electric Eye on the Rock Friday Rock Show. I didn't realise um, it was Priest until he said. I was like, oh, was that Priest? Um, the opening of this album is so powerful. It's so awesome. Uh, it's just, wow. The Hellion into Electric Eye, into Riding on the Wind, into... One of the album's great deep cups, Bloodstone. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. Then you've got Take These Chains, which is a track they used, an outside songwriter called Bob Halligan Jr. for that, who's done another a tracks for the band. Uh, and it's a, good, it's a good commercial metal track, obviously trying for a single. Um, uh, album finishes side with Pain and Pleasure, which is probably one of my, my least favourite tracks on the album. Then it opens up side two, Scream for Vengeance, really uh, out and out you know, fast track with Halford screaming. You've got another thing coming, which a lot of people will know, which uh, that was a quite a mi minor hit in America, number 66 it made, and uh, the airplay it got meant, the album got a lot of uh, sales. And the second last track, Fever, again, that's a track I'm not quite as keen on, more commercial. And then it finishes with Devil's Child, which I love. Got a great, um, it's, practically, it's got one of the all-time Halford moments of that. And it's my favourite K.K. Downing solo on that. I should just say, up until now, obviously, K.K. and Glenn, uh, his guitar is always great, and they do a lot of uh, harmony guitars. Uh, and this inspired loads of metal bands to use two guitars. Um, obviously, in, in Wishbone, Ash and Finn Lizzy as well. Um, but for heavy metal fans, you know, K.K. and Glenn were the premier guitar duo. Um, but on this album, they really step up. Um, uh, they really do some phenomenal solos. They're obviously practicing harder, riding on the wind. They use the whammy bars extensively. There's two-handed tapping on the electric eye solo, if you know guitar techniques here. Um, very good. Uh, the production's really good. You've got like a really beefy guitar sound. It's quite open. It's got a big drum sound. So it did phenomenal stuff for the band. Yeah, this was probably my second or third favourite Judas Priest album for a long time. But now... I, you know, like I said, I prefer the 70s stuff, but it's got a special place in my heart. And as well, um, my mum went to get this for me, so I went to primary school that day, and she was going to Lancaster, and I said, could you get the Judas Priest album for me, and, you know, probably handed over my pocket money. And uh, she came back with that, and she also came back with a small practice amp, because I'd just got an electric guitar a few months before that. So was it, do I plug into the practice amp, or do I play Screaming for Vengeance? I played Scream for Vengeance first. Um, so there you go. That's how excited it was. Exciting. Next up, didn't buy this album at the time, my brother did. A uh, little interesting story about this um, Defenders of the Faith. The time this came out, we were off school because there'd been loads of snow in Cumbria. Um, so we had, um, you know, probably a week out of school or three days. It felt like ages back then. So there was a lot of snow and I remember my brother got his arm and I seem to remember putting it on the turntable and having a good listen to it. Um, so it's very much, just showing you the cover again, it's very much kind of screaming for Vengeance Part 2. Came with a cool uh, inner sleeve with um, uh, the, the lads there, uh, the lyrics. Obviously the rattle company is giving the priest more of a budget. And uh, yeah, this album... The side one, Free Will Burning, Jawbreaker, Rock Out, Rye Free, The Sentinel. So four tracks on side one, absolutely brilliant. Phenomenal. Side two is not as strong for me. You've got Love Bites, cool track, Eat Me Alive. Yeah, they got in trouble for that one with the uh, PMRC. Some Heads Are Gonna Roll. I really like that track. It's a commercial sort of hard rocker and it's written by Bob Halligan Jr. again. Really good. Then you've got Night Comes Down, which is a cool ballad. The Nelm kind of tails off, it's got a track on Heavy Duty and it goes into Defense of the Faith, which is a short piece. So it kind of tails off a little bit for me. Um, the production, it uses a drum machine, which 
I don't think any of us realised at the time, but listening now, um, I think it is. Um, so it hasn't aged as well, the production. But for a lot of people, it's one of their great albums. I think if you got into it at the time, um, it is. So I've always preferred British Steel and Screaming, but I, I would argue this is the end of the sort of classic, you know, Judas Priest era. Um, and what I mean by that, they get the first album out in 74, and by 84, they've broken the States. They're, they're pretty popular worldwide, although they have lost a bit of ground in the UK from not touring enough. And they all those albums kind of make a, a kind of progressive whole. Yep. Okay, so we'll um, uh, move on with the next part in a sec.